Oliver Barham. Hello, everybody, and welcome back from lunch. Uh, my name is Oliver Barham. I work for the US Navy at the Naval Surface Warfare Center Indian Head Division. We're an R&D lab about an hour south of Washington, DC. And today I'm here to talk to you about a project that uh, happened over the course of 2019 and 2021 that's called uh, HIVER. There's this uh, uh, acronym which you can read, and also if you like cute names, you'll note that hiver uh, en français means winter, the season when it's cold outside. And uh, myself, Carl Gotzmer, Lou DeShiro are the primary PIs at the NSWC Indian Head where we work, and we're gonna be talking to you about all our results from this effort. Uh, really quickly, I know that we have a diverse audience here, and I wanted to highlight a couple of things from the literature that when I was uh, looking into this field that I liked, uh, maybe just take 30 seconds to a minute here, uh, and uh, if you haven't seen any of these reports, they're all openly available on the internet. So uh, in 1989, Hans and Fleischmann started this field and gave the world a new hope. Unfortunately, six months later, the first Department of Energy report said, nope, okay, I can't do any more rhyming, I'm not Baba. But continuing on, we've got Spaywar um, uh, putting out a bunch of papers, reports, and one patent we're gonna talk about here. Uh, some of the people in this room went back to the Department of Energy in 2004 and said, can you take another look at this? Uh, they put together a panel and they still said, interesting results, but uh, we're not gonna start a program on it. The Naval Research Lab published work and uh, electrochemistry, similar to what we're going to be talking about. The Defense Intelligence Agency has a report uh, available on the internet where they said that if Leonard is real, it could be a big deal. Uh, SRI International, you guys all know, worked for 25 years in this field and published a report on that. Uh, CERN, uh, they're not in the U.S., but that was very interesting. They had a meeting, a colloquium about the theory. Uh, people got together. There's uh, PowerPoints online you can find and couldn't come to any big conclusions. Uh, NASA, we heard from several times over this week. Uh, they've been doing a lot of great work. And then we know about the Google and uh, everything else there in the chart brings us to where we are today. So that's some of the kind of interesting background. Um, I won't belabor uh, this chart. Uh, I already talked about my theory that a rising scientific tide uh, will lift all boats. So I don't want to belabor the point that uh, I think we should try to publish as widely and as much as we can to help everybody in this field, from industry to academia to the government. I think a very important part of what we did was we developed uh, and, and recruited a broad team. Uh, we started off with Navy researchers, but then we went outside the Navy to the Army. Uh, we have a nuclear physicist from Army Research Lab. We went to the National Institute of Standards and Technology and had some material science help from them. Um, we also uh, re uh, recruited a number of other uh, organizations. We had more than half a dozen different institutions and about uh, more than a dozen researchers and scientists and technicians all together working on this effort. And one thing that we did was because we had this broad team, when we had results, we all got together, talked about the results, put together a joint conclusion, and this is what we said to our sponsors, to DARPA, uh, and what we uh, put together into a, a paper, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So the basis for our experiments were on the earlier SPAWAR work. This is uh, some pictures from the patent in 2013 that described an electrochemical procedure. We didn't follow this exactly, um, but it was uh, close. We modified the electrochemical recipe a little bit, uh, I'll talk about. But basically, it's uh, the, the same thing. We used uh, cells that contained uh, heavy water-based electrolyte with lithium chloride salts, palladium dichloride, where we pulled the palladium out and uh, co-deposited uh, layers uh, onto the cathode. There's a little cartoon there on the left that shows some of the ions in solution, obviously not to scale, followed by some pictures of the 3D printed enclosures that we used. On the outside of the, the base of the enclosure, you'll see the arrow says CBEC sensors. Uh, I've got some show and tell items being passed around. Someone raise your hand where the show and tell is at the moment. Somewhere around here. Okay, yeah, keep passing those guys around. So we've got one of the CBEC sensors, which is um, a solid state device we use to measure thermal flux through the walls of the cell. And we've talked a lot about CR39. There's an excellent uh, presentation by Eric yesterday, so I won't uh, talk much about them and how they work, but we have integrated holders in the posts that hold our electrodes and also hold the CR39 in very close proximity to the electrodes so that we can try to be very close to the location of these putative particles that we're trying to measure. We know a lot about CR39. I think you saw some of these actual same charts before. I'll just say that other Organizations and other institutions have been using this for uh, high energy physics and for uh, stellar and uh, other types of uh, physics outside the Earth. 
So it's not a new technique. Um, we are using it in a slightly different way. I'll talk about that next. But when we were uh, starting this project, we had a combination of people who were skilled in the art and people who didn't know much about it. And so one of the things we wanted to do is when we started using CR39, we want to have some kind of controlled procedure for creating uh, tracks that we knew were from a radioactive source. So we got uh, a colleague at the Army Research Lab to uh, give us access to a thorium-230 source in his laboratory. We exposed some virgin chips to this uh, alpha emitter, so this known radioactive source. We took those chips and we etched them and, followed, and created our procedure uh, that we would use throughout the course of our experiments, and we saw the tracks. So we know that this known radioactive source gave us these known tracks of a certain dimension. Uh, one other interesting thing we did here was the detector itself has uh, coating on top. We cut that coating in half, left the coating on half the chip, and removed it on the other half. And that's in the side facing the cathode where these putative particles are coming out of. The reason we did that was that thin plastic layer would be enough to stop some of the particles in the you know, low MeV range. And if we saw tracks on one side where there was no covering film and not on the covered side, it lets us know roughly the range of the energies of the particles, not exactly, but even more importantly, if there was some effect causing the tracks that was across the whole chip, we would expect to see uh, anomalies equally on both sides underneath the protective barrier and the side that was unprotected. And we tended to see tracks only uh, in clusters, only on the side that was unprotected to try to rule out chip-wide thermal anomalies. Uh, this is a sample of some of our results. Uh, I think we showed this chart uh, last October. Uh, this is in the middle of CR39 chip, just like the one that's being passed around. After an experiment, it was uh, optically scanned uh, using an open source software called ImageJ to uh, grab the locations of tracks. And you can see uh, close-ups of different locations, number seven, number nine. There was maybe a dozen different locations with tracks there. Some of them were low-density tracks we think were background. And some of them, like these seven and nine that we're highlighting, were high-density regions that we don't think it's any way that it could be background. We think that um, these are locations of uh, high-density clusters of nominally MeV from about 0.1 MeV to 20 MeV is a range of CR39 uh, particles. Uh, up in D, you see a chip that uh, was etched that did not have uh, any tracks uh, from a control experiment. The ones looked very similar to that from ones that were not in our experiments and from a couple of control experiments. And right below that in C, uh, you see another uh, etching done with the same conditions as D, but from an experiment that showed excess heat. So overall, uh, we had six different uh, experiments that we ran uh, with palladium that we saw unusual conditions like RF and excess heat. And six out of six times, we saw these large, denses, dense tracks uh, on the cathodes. Unfortunately, because of resource constraints, we couldn't do this. We'd love to have done this dozens more times, but we just didn't have the resources. So we hope to do things like that in the future, just to collect even more and more data. Uh, we also tried to collect neutron results. Uh, we had a helium-3-based neutron detector. Um, and uh, briefly, on, on the charts here, you see in red are days marked on the calendar where we were doing experimental run with palladium. Blue were days where we did background counts of various sizes. Uh, the X bar is the average counts per minute, and the number of data points is below that. So uh, when you compare, for example, Friday the 2nd of October, there was an average of 5.91 neutrons per minute. The background count from the 5th to the 6th is roughly the same amount of neutrons per minute, uh, but then run 28 was 6.33, Per minute. So how do we know if these are statistically significant results or not? Uh, we used a very simple statistical approach that a lot of you guys have probably learned in school called the Z-test method. And so, for example, in this uh, particular run of the five and six background count, followed by an active run on the 7th of October, the uh, difference there when we use the Z-test, which is a difference in the means minus the difference in the expected means, which is zero, we expect them to be the same. Uh, divide by the variance over the number of data points. All this does together is give you uh, the sigma of this, uh, of this comparison of these two sets of data. So there was a couple that were significant. That's 3.9 sigma, which is another way of saying there was a 1 in 20,000 chance that uh, event at least that extreme or more extreme could have happened just by luck, just by chance. There was a little bit lower one at the end of October, and there was a 10 sigma, which is much higher at the end of January. 
Now, there's a problem with this data. Uh, the problem is if you look at just the background counts between October and January, the, these sets of experiments we're showing here, the background varies from 5.89 in the 5th and 6th of October uh, to uh, 6.12 down at the end at the 20, 21st of January. So the background in the lab was going up and down over time, and we unfortunately only had one detector. So as a team, we decided that these results were in the end not uh, statistically significant enough to say that we saw positive neutrons. Now, what we need in the future is we need more detectors. We need redundant detectors. We need to have a detector or two next to our cell, hopefully collecting data like this, and then some across the hall or across the lab uh, that are giving us the real-time background in the lab. Uh, we even went and tried to get background measurements from uh, the Pentagon, which is about 30 miles from where we are, from other places. Uh, we weren't able to round up that data for these exact days. Uh, and so the best thing to do would just be to have more uh, detectors. Uh, so that's uh, where we left that, and hopefully in the future we'll have more opportunities to do tests like that. Uh, the next thing we did was, uh, er, concurrently we were doing modeling, so that if we saw statistically significant numbers of neutrons at the detector, we could say, correlate that back to the putative location of those particles inside the cell at the cathode, and say if we saw one neutron at the detector, it's six to 12 inches away from the, uh, the cell itself, how many neutrons are being generated. So there's a, a Monte Carlo approach, a statistical approach here in uh, figure one at the top. You can see a mock-up in 3D of our experimental setup where we had the box number one, which is our cell, followed by the helium-3 detector two inside of a uh, polyethylene uh, monitoring blocks three, and there's a gamma ray detector five um, that we only had the gamma ray detector for a couple of runs and did not see any anomalies with the gamma rays. But uh, through this kind of analysis, if we do see in the future statistically significant numbers of neutrons, we can back out what the rate of generation might be at the cathode, assuming that's where they're coming from. Uh, we have a theoretical roadmap, and uh, a lot of you in this room know Lou DeShero. He's been working on this for a long time. Uh, it's based on density functional theory, which is one of the most highly cited theories in all of science. So it's a very firm bedrock on which to build a theory. So we build models of uh, lattices, atomic lattices, with various assumptions. We put hydrogen or heavy hydrogen into those lattices, and we run electric current in one direction through the lattice. And with the right assumptions, for example, that the cell is set up at an energy level, that there is a molecule of deuterium in there, but it's right on the edge of wanting to break apart into two separate monatomic atoms. At that, if with that assumption, if electrons are coming through in one direction, they can break apart the molecule, when the electron leaves, it comes back together. A new electron comes behind it, breaks it apart, it leaves, it comes back together. And in this way, we can try to initiate a uh, hardening and pumping action, what we call parametric pumping with DC current inside uh, the cell. So this is just a working theory. We're not saying we think this is exactly what's happening, but we're using a well-known tool to try to build the framework, which we're going to keep using. And we're going to try to plug the material science data into this so that we're building an accurate model. Because how do we know all these assumptions are right that we're putting in our model? You can make you know, garbage in, garbage out. You can make anything you want. So uh, this is also some results um, that show that over time, uh, the spin changes. If you have uh, clusters of these uh, deuterons uh, vibrating, you can have large changes in the ground state energy of the cell. Uh, the, the molecular and atomic properties, which could cause them to come closer and closer together over time. So, but how do we know if any of this will be accurate in the future? Uh, we started doing some material analysis. So our colleagues at, at NIST uh, did the typical uh, morphology composition and structure for us. This is after the experiments are done. We take the experiments apart in our DoD laboratories. We ship them down the road uh, to NIST, a separate department, so you know, we're keeping things uh, uh, separate, we're not doing everything in-house, and they analyzed them. There's some pictures on the top of the morphology of an as-received platinum wire. That's our substrate, is platinum, uh, which does not want to absorb hydrogen. And we plate the palladium on top, which does want to absorb hydrogen. So there's some other images uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slide. Composition, we looked for transmutations. We did not see any statistically significant uh, transmutations, but I will say this is a very difficult process when you've got as several people I think have mentioned this week, you've got millimeters of square area or centimeters, and you're trying to find something that's microns in size. Uh, it's kind of difficult sometimes to know where to start looking. Uh, we did not see any. And uh, we did the structure to look for uh, the phases of palladium and any interesting structures that were uh, being built up. And all this is documented in a, a paper that we've submitted for publication. 
uh, the morphologies themselves are uh, chemists on board said they look uh, typical of electroplated uh, electroplated morphologies. Uh, our experts did not say that there was anything uh, anomalous that we could see here. I'm curious about all your thoughts. If any of you uh, see anything interesting in the pictures, feel free to come up and we can talk about them. Um, and so uh, the, the, the bottom line was that there was no uh, anomaly, anomalous effects that we saw right away. I think uh, everyone in this room knows about uh, thermal effects and measuring excess heat. So we used those CBEX sensors on the outside of our cell to measure thermal flux coming through the walls of our container. Uh, and just very quickly, the one on the left was a cell without palladium in it. And the black line is the power in electrically. The green line is the thermal power out through those sensors that are being passed around. And when everything works the way we calibrate it, they lie on top of each other. The cell on the right was a run with the same hardware uh, uh, two days later. And that one showed for the same roughly 15 watts of input power in the black line, there was roughly 20 watts of uh, thermal output power. So an anomalous five watts is that difference, you know, roughly 30% excess heat is the difference between the green and black lines. Uh, the yellow line is uh, an ambient thermocouple sitting outside the experiment. It's just to show that there were no anomalous uh, thermal events during the course of that run. And so this, is, uh, this particular set of data is from less than a day. We would run for a day or two, and we would see this uh, over and over again. We saw this uh, uh, many times, maybe 10 times or something. We saw similar uh, types of events. We also monitor for RF. So we have an RF sensor, uh, which is it's kind of hard to see. It's in the red circle. It's a black uh, current probe that is clamped around our cathode wire. And what that does is it looks for any radio frequency signals that could be running up and down that wire. Now, a wire is just like an antenna. So if we're talking on our cell phones next to the experiment, it'll probably pick something up. So you have to be very careful when you're analyzing this data and uh, throw up or question signals that are higher than, say, 600 megahertz, because that's up in the range where it could be communications and, and things like that. So there's, uh, there's work to be done on analyzing this data. We did see anomalies in several frequencies previously uh, reported by, for example, the Bacris group in Texas A&M, around 90 megahertz, around 330 megahertz. Uh, our uh, colleague, Professor Chalani, mentioned 330 megahertz in his presentation a couple days ago. So we've seen some frequencies that other groups have also talked about before us. Uh, in, addition, uh, in addition here, there's a lot of data here, but the only thing we'd like to focus on are the brown traces. Uh, this is raw data, no smoothing, it looks kind of uh, messy. But in all four of these cases, we see a low level of RF activity, uh, the same as it was before the experiment started, continues into the experiment. And then about an hour, the first, during the first hour of uh, electrolysis, it jumps up to a higher level and then remains roughly consistent uh, for hours afterwards. So this is something we saw over and over again, that there appeared to be, uh, or there was uh, RF detected during experiments that weren't there uh, when we started. And so uh, we're open to talking about uh, analysis and implications of, of all these results. So overall, uh, what do we say? So our team came together. We gave a final report to DARPA, which we also wrote up in a journal paper, which we're waiting to hear back on at the moment. So overall, we think that this work is important. It should continue. But we don't think this is uh, conclusive and decisive evidence. We don't think this is the, you know, uh, worthy of submitting to the top journals uh, just yet. Uh, we think that this is uh, initial evidence of the new scientific phenomenon. We'd like to keep going. We'd like to bring specifically more detectors to the party. We need to have two, three different kinds of nuclear methodologies, uh, spectroscopic methods, to look for th these anomalous results to get to that next level, in my opinion, for our results of our, uh, of our effort. And uh, we're, like, we're interested in uh, working with other people. Uh, the, our, Public Affairs Office is listed there at the bottom. If you're outside the government and you'd like to work with us, send an email to our Public Affairs. They can get in touch with us and put us together. We can talk about team agreements. And uh, overall, uh, we're hoping that uh, this work continues and are very interested in continuing ourselves. So with that, I'd like to thank you and ask for any questions.